Greetings Race Community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, Mark Llewellyn, who is the Vice President for Advancement at the University of Virginia. Welcome, Mark. Hey, Brent. Good to see you. So Mark and I were just catching up before we went live. Many of you know, uh, because you listened to a bunch of episodes that were recorded in an RV, that my family and I recently concluded our uh, 12,000 mile, uh, 10 month, 33 state RV adventure. And as I was doing that, Mark shared uh, a similar, uh, not quite 10 months, but a similar journey uh, with some pretty poignant memories. So we are kindred spirits as it relates to uh, a different kind of road warrior life. But I'm thrilled to welcome Mark. Uh, he's uh, a great leader in this space. And just yesterday, Mark, I got to say, uh, I loved reading uh, Carol Packard's post, <laughs> who was sharing the news about her recent promotion at Cornell. And she uh, honestly wrote one of the most, I, I thought, beautifully yeah. uh, sort of summarized um, synopsis of her career and gave a whole bunch of shout outs to mentors, which is a recurring theme here on the podcast. And, and you were one of those folks. So um did you have a, a sense that you'd be getting tagged on LinkedIn yesterday or was that a surprise? <laughs> no, no, I was not. And I'm super thrilled for Carol. She's she's going to do a great job and has done a great job for Cornell and, and Penn State before that. Um, it was funny, Brent. I was actually on a, on a phone call with one of the other people she mentioned in that post when the post came through. And so we got a good chuckle when I talked to Carol right afterwards and congratulate her. But it's a uh, Carol, again, is a great asset for Cornell, great asset for the industry, and I'm just, I couldn't be more excited for it. Well, we talk a lot about how tight-knit the sector is, so the fact that uh, you were having a conversation while getting tagged on a post about all of the connections around Carol is uh, is fitting. And, uh, well, Mark, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, but one of the things we've been doing with our recent guest that's been a lot of fun is to actually reflect on your own college journey. Oftentimes, that can be uh, something that planted the seeds in, in, in what led to uh, an advancement career. So I'd love for you to take me back, if you would, to junior year of high school at Allegheny Clarion Valley High and uh, tell me about that guy, Mark, and what he was into <laughs> and ultimately what led you to uh, Allegheny College. That's, that's, that's funny, Brad. No, I, I grew up in a, a very small town in western Pennsylvania, about 800 people, um, my parents were both school teachers in the town. My, my grandmother was a school teacher uh, before that. And I just had always planned to be a school teacher. I bounced around a little bit in late high school from wanting to be a JAG attorney to wanting to be a psychologist to wanting to be a police officer and finally landed on being uh, uh, a school teacher. And so I, I went to Allegheny mainly motivated because my guidance counselor, who was also our football trainer at the time in a small school, had gone to Allegheny and he was a mentor and good friend and, and took care of us a lot. And and he had told me a little bit about it. And I'll never forget him calling me to his office one day over the loudspeaker um, and saying that if I got my grades up, that he would actually write a letter of recommendation. But if I didn't, he wouldn't. And so that was kind of the motivating thing for me. I was probably a little more focused on other things at the time. And so uh, he did, and I ended up going to Allegheny and uh, so and decided to be an elementary school teacher. And so that was kind of the plan. The plan was then to go after my principal's papers and be an elementary school teacher, just like my parent. My dad was a high school teacher. My mom taught both elementary and high school, and my grandma was an elementary school teacher. So that was the plan. It was not a plan to go into fundraising by any means, but um you know, I always say, you know, one of the greatest joys as a kid that I had, Brent, was actually selling things. I absolutely loved fundraisers as a kid. And growing up in a small town, I literally would draw the town every time we had to sell submarine sandwiches or pizzas or PTA things. And I would literally just go house to house and I'd do it every week. I just absolutely loved it. So my dad always teased me that I would I would could sell anything or would want to sell anything. And so I think my my passion for education was deep rooted in our family, but my passion for fundraising probably came at a much younger age by selling pizzas and things like that. I love that. Any uh, notable awards or prizes? Uh, I was just thinking yesterday there was a little community festival here and they were doing free helicopter rides and my kids really wanted to go. And I was thinking back to the time that I led my middle school in magazine sales and had the opportunity to ride on a small plane out of a local airport. I don't remember why that was the prize, but, um, and then I also did a bunch of time selling fruit as a member of the yeah. FFA. So that was a big, yeah. uh, big deal as well. Any, any memorable, uh, awards or was it just for the good of the cause? 
I don't know if there's any memorable work, but I well, the one thing I do remember very clearly is selling submarines. We, we call them hoagies in Western Pennsylvania, but we would sell hoagies and I would literally draw a map of the town on graph paper on our dining room table. And I would draw every house and I knew who had onions, who had no onions and who would never buy. So, and I'd put an X, so I wouldn't even go to their houses, but the people that would buy onions, I would say, you know, can we put you down for two no onions again or onions? And so I, I had a whole map of the town that I would have every time. And I remember keeping it from every time we would sell hoagies and my dad's station wagon just smelling like onions. But um, that, I that never imagined, but... I never imagined that hoagie stewardship could be a thing, <laughs> but it sounds like you were really trying to make the buyers feel appreciated and uh, ensuring that you understood their preferences. So uh, yeah, absolutely. That's, um, I love it. Sounds like this is a, a pre Google Maps, pre uh, even MapQuest yeah, mode. So, uh, you know, the old uh, being able to read a map is a skill that's hard to come by these days. So um, uh, tell me about the experience at Allegheny College, small college in Meadville, Pennsylvania, right around 20,000 alumni, I believe. Was it a terrific experience, an okay experience? Were you really involved, not too involved? I mean, what was sort of the the um the overall uh experience there yeah you know brent allegheny was just a tremendous experience for me and for my wife um you know probably first and foremost the important part was meeting my wife you know we met the, f- the first couple of days of school and it da- ended up started dating the second semester of our freshman year and were engaged by the time we were seniors so you know that was um probably hands down the most important part of my collegiate experience um, you know, I think more, more broadly about Allegheny, though, you know, it was a, it's a place that really cares about the student experience and about student involvement. And so I probably should have been a little more involved in my academics than what I should. But um, I go back to education. I, I couldn't major in education. They didn't offer that you minored in it, um, but you majored in a field. So I majored in English and then minored in, in elementary ed and got my teaching certification. But I think that the real thing for me was being involved across the campus. I was really involved in my fraternity. I was really involved in the programming boards and different things. And, and it just gave me lots of opportunities to meet different people. Um, and frankly, was what kind of drew me to my career um, that I would never have guessed. Uh, my wife actually worked in the development office, opening checks. And back in the day when you actually clipped out uh, articles from the newspaper when someone got engaged or something like that. So I would my fraternity house was right next door to the development office. So I'd pick her up and would go to dinner. And so I got to know this gregarious group of people who were really kind to me as a, as an undergrad, um, just every day stopping by and picking up my now wife to go to dinner. And, and then I actually had a, my advisor was the one who suggested that I consider a career in higher education. So it was not on the radar screen at all. Um, but I think the mix of the experience at Allegheny, really teaching us. It was a great school for learning how to write and how to communicate and how to convey um, kind of rhetorical uh, messaging. And I think it was a great background for the profession. But again, I wouldn't have thought about it at all if it wasn't for you know, my wife's uh, work study job and uh, the advisor who kind of pulled me in this direction. Love it. You graduated in the year 2000. Um, so you had to survive Y2K and all the excitement around that. And it was obviously uh, really peak internet boom time. And I was doing a little bit of research before this uh, interview. And I found a flyer that reads something like this. If you already have a website that looks good, <laughs> and you just want to add our interactive functionality, online donation capability, content management service or monthly e-letter feature, call Mark Llewellyn for a price (laughs) quote, 800-598-4050. That was Affinity Connection. So Mark, in addition to growing up in really small uh, towns in the Midwest, uh, we are kindred spirits in the intersection of the internet and advancement entrepreneurship. So tell me a little bit about what led you to uh, Affinity Connection and uh, yeah, this... um, this flyer is just a piece of work. So I'll, I'll make sure to share it with you if you haven't seen it in a while. No, that's, that's, that's funny, Brad, uh, good research. Um, so as I mentioned, my advisor, uh, I went to my advisor my senior year and, and asked if he would write a letter of recommendation for me for, for teaching. Um, and he said he would, but he also wanted to suggest that I consider higher education philanthropy or admissions. He thought that that could be a career path for me. So I had this wonderful 
reference letter that I still have at home that says I'd be uh, a really good elementary school teacher or really good in higher education philanthropy or uh, admissions. Uh, I don't know what that says about our profession, but it was uh, it's a very funny um, uh, recommendation that I received. So my wife and I ended up moving to state college. We were engaged at the time and she was accepted into a PhD program. And so I was looking for a teaching job while she went for her PhD. And um, I, I was just past the point of the year when they were hiring teachers. So there wasn't an opportunity. And there was literally an ad in the paper uh, back when we still looked in the paper for a job that said looking for someone for, with an English degree and strong fraternity experience for a job uh, as an account rep. And so I guess like, they're looking for me. Yeah. Me. Was, yeah. I was like, this is really funny. And uh, so I called the ad. It ended up being a company called Stuart Howe Alumni Association, which uh, provided alumni relations and development services, mainly for the Greek organizations around the country, for the alumni organizations of those groups. And I called it, um, got a call back, actually hung up the first time I got the call. I thought they were calling for directory information and hung up. And so uh, they called me back and we were like, no, we actually want you to interview. Went to uh, interview for the job about a week after moving to State College and got the job. Thought I'd do it for 90 days and maybe 180 days and get a teaching job. And so I started as an account rep and about 30 days later, the company, which had been in existence for 30 years based out of State College, um, uh, the company was sold about 30 days after I got there. And it was sold to a client um, who had had a very successful career in sales and marketing and had bought the company. And so I thought I was, you know, I was last person in, I figured I'd be the first person out with the new, new ownership and uh, was really blessed with a great mentor, a gentleman by the name of Greg Woodman, uh, who still owns the company today who changed the name to Affinity Connection um, and then broadened the services to really help affinity groups on college and, and university campuses, um, nonprofits, et cetera, and everything from database management to running their annual fund or, you know, major gift fundraising. So um, it was kind of, I always say it was kind of like Costco in a way. We did all the services that a major university would have, but we broke bulk across smaller affinity groups that maybe had, you know, a thousand or 2000 alumni, but we managed like 600,000 alumni records just across 70 campuses across the country. And so I started as an account rep, uh, had a great opportunity under Greg to take over sales. And to your point, we started selling web services uh, when, you know, affinity groups were looking for database backend driven web services. I still remember the opening uh, sale price was a thousand dollar setup fee. And I thought that was a lot of money uh, for this and a you know, hundred bucks a month to maintain it. Um, but that was kind of the start and then ended up growing into major gift work and overseeing the major gift work. And that was, you know, before I left to go to Penn State. A great opportunity, really, really kind of scrappy entrepreneurial skills. I always said it was like having a, a working MBA because I was, I was just learning about PL responsibility and, and receivables and sales, things that as an English major, I had no idea about. So it was just a, an amazing experience for me. So when you reflect on selling hoagies or selling the Affinity Connection offerings, uh, were there any memories, good or bad, early in that sales career? Because I'm sure it's a grind. I mean, you're trying to get meetings. Yeah. You're probably dialing for dollars. I'm sure yeah. it was a little bit referral-based given how well-connected this industry always has been. But um, what were some of the highs and lows during the uh, Pretty good run there, six years uh, overall. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure there were many lows. I mean, there were some learning moments, obviously, um, but I wouldn't say there were lows. I mean, I think the upsides were, it was you know, same as selling hoagies as an eight year old boy. It was it was all about relationships to me, and really investing in relationships with our clients, really investing in relationships with others, vendors, etc. And you know, just like knowing who bought what hoagies as an eight-year-old kid. You, you knew the people. And so it was a great opportunity. And a lot of people really mentored me when I was just getting started. So I asked a ton of questions. I was managing people with 20 more years experience than I did. So, I mean, it just, it just, you know, I was kind of that kid who was just learning as I, as I went, but you know, they made a bet on me, which was, which was wonderful. And, uh, I think the the most educational, I would say, and was a little bit of a low point, but I guess you, if you wanted to call a low point, uh, I guess we're two, actually. After 9-11, um, you know, consulting services for smaller nonprofits, it was just a really tough time. And so thinking about your business model, thinking about how you uh, support your employees, how you handle your employees. I mean, it was as a 
is a very young employee. That was an eye opener for me, uh, how we worked through it. I think the second part was um, I'd always been on the sales side of things. And one day, Greg, who again, who owned the company, walked in and told me I was now in charge of receivables. And my my bonus checks were tied to getting paid, not bookings. And that really taught me a lot about, um, you know, the kind of business you take, the kind of how you work with people, how do you, you know, how, what you sell, when you sell it. It gave me more of an owner's mentality, even though I didn't have a stake in the company versus just a sales guy tech, uh, you know, background. So to, to me, that was, that was probably the, there were some, there were some highs and lows of taking over receivables in addition to, to running the sales operation. But uh, that was probably the most informative part of the whole process. Love it. Was it uh, an easy decision to transition over to Penn State? I mean, you're, I think, still in the State College area at this time and yeah. uh, clearly um, uh, had been getting connected there. And I know that you ended up pursuing some uh, additional education at Penn State uh, as you uh, joined in a um, associate director of development role. So uh, somebody pull you over there. What was sort of the catalyst to uh, to move, I mean, you were tangentially in the space, but uh, to sort of go uh, on the inside and, and work uh, directly within higher ed. You, you know, it's it's interesting, Brent. It, it was it was a hard decision and a very easy decision. So on the hard side of things, we had great relationships and people who had mentored and invested a lot of time in me. So the part was breaking away from that, whether they be clients or supervisor. And again, I work directly for the owner. So the fact that he, you know, invested so much time in me as a young person was, you know, that was the hard part. Um, we still to this day talk regularly. So it's not, and that's been, you know, a long time ago now. Um, and he's still a mentor to me, but you know, the, that was the tough part. The easy part was I, um, uh, had originally been contacted by Penn state cause I was in town about their director of annual giving job. And I thought, boy, I was just becoming a new dad. I thought this would limit my travel. I could be home more. Um, I thought that that was the route I wanted. And I didn't get the job. I was a finalist, but didn't get the job. But that was really the connection point to where I thought um, my interest really lied was, was more major giving. And so, you know, I actually took a pay cut to go to Penn State. Um, it was, it was a, a decision of really around what was driving my personal interest. And so I had just fallen in love, fallen in love with the major gift side. And so once I got into that at Penn State, I had a lot to learn because again, I was more on the, on the sales side of the same services, but um, I, it was just the relationship kind of sales component of the work that I, I just loved. And so once I got into Penn State, you know, it was a no brainer to make that shift. But I, I think the relationship part of it was, is always the challenging part anytime you make a shift. Sometimes people in this sector get uncomfortable when you use the term sales uh, yeah. and nobody gets uncomfortable with the phrase marketing, but people get uncomfortable with the phrase sales. You've said it a lot on this podcast yeah. already, and we feel strongly that um, embracing modern sales principles, technology strategies is going to be key for advancement to continue to evolve in an increasingly digital context. Um, but the way that you're talking about sales it's the, it's the sales experience where the kid remembers that you wanted onions or you didn't, or yeah. uh, somebody really gets to know you. And I, I always talk about, you know, when we're talking about sales, we mean good sales, like the kind yeah. of sales that's a really positive mutual experience, not the connotations that can sometimes be negative. Do you ever get pushback within your peer group or uh, maybe even within teams that you've worked with? Because uh, I imagine you talk about sales the way you are today, um, consistently with 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 your staff or with peers. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question, Brent. Um, it, you know, uh, actually, I don't talk much about it. I mean, I'm talking about it now because that part of my career really was sales. Um, yeah, I was not a major gift fundraiser. I was I was running a sales operation, and so you know that that's what it was. Um, however, I think to your point, the principles are much the same. You know, we're not. Uh, in product sales, we're not in selling widgets. We're in relationships and helping people connect with what their affinity is. You know, one of the things I love most about higher education philanthropy is we're, we're, we're big organizations that are solving a lot of the the nation and the world's problems. And so, you know, someone's interest could be climate change. Someone else could be poverty. Someone else's interest could be, you know, whatever. Um, 
you know, we, we can usually connect people with where their interests are, but a lot of the, a lot of the structure and infrastructure that's needed in these large organizations are not unsimilar, you know, CRM solutions, et cetera. We don't talk about that a lot, obviously publicly, but it's, um, it's one of the reasons I like it because I did love sales and marketing when I was in the private sector. And I think the benefit now is for me, the end outcome is actually helping others. So where you, it's not just driving the bottom line, which is part of our jobs, don't get me wrong, but it's really about what impact are we making on society, on our students, on our faculty and letting them do it. So um, it, to me, it was uh, a welcome change, not to just be looking at quarterly profits um, or quarterly bonuses, but more about what is the impact on society. And to me, that's, that's a, a probably a stronger motivator than anything else. I love that. And when you think about um, that time at Penn State, you were there for seven years. You started uh, really right before the financial crisis. So I imagine mm-hmm. that threw a few uh, curveballs along the way. Uh, and you were there during a pretty tumultuous you know, time, uh, especially at the end. And I don't know if you ever crossed paths with Bill O'Brien, but he was uh, he's been pretty involved with the Brown football uh, program mm-hmm. where I, uh, mm-hmm. where I uh, am serving on the board and um, got to sort of see some of the, um, I don't know, just a window into his world there. And I'm just curious as you think about maybe navigating, you mentioned 9-11, the financial crisis, some of the institutional uh, challenges in the wake of, um, uh, you know, some of the uh, well-known, let's call it uh, scandals at Penn State. Um, uh, w- what was it like sort of stay in the course, uh, trying to stay focused uh, in the midst of the inevitable sort of things that are out of your control, but still have an influence on uh, sentiment, uh, capacity, uh, you name it? It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a question that's come up a lot. Um, obviously, in my career, particularly through some of the experiences I've had, um, you know, I think I'll come back to the same thing I mentioned as a, again, eight-year-old boy. I mean, it's all about relationships. And, you know, what I tend to think about, whether it's at Virginia or whether it was during the time at Penn State, um, you know, the people that we engage with have kind of like a 40 to 50 year marriage with the institution, sometimes a little shorter, depending on age, sometimes a little bit longer. But, you know, we're there for a part of that marriage, not the whole time. I mean, I hope in our industry, people stay a little longer at institutions. I think that's an issue we have to work on because you're not just there for the good times, but you're there in the tough times. And I think that's how real relationships are, are formed um, is when you're, you're there for people and for the institution during those, those, uh, those tough times. But, you know, I look at things that, you know, I remember a call um, that, that I took during the Sandusky scandal that where one of our alums, who was a dear friend of mine, you know, had been on a cruise while the, while everything broke. And he called me as soon as he got back and said, what can I do? And I said, I, I could really just have, could really love to have lunch with you. And I'd like to drive down to Philly and spend some time with you. That, that individual is now deceased and, and I miss him dearly, but I just went down to Philly and had a Reuben with them in a deli. And, you know, our relationship got closer because it wasn't a transactional relationship. It was about caring, about love for the institution, love for us and the roles that we play. And, you know, I think that's the part that I just, you know, we're always going to have ups and downs. There's always going to be something in the market. There's always going to be national things. There's always going to be institute uh, issues at our institutions at times. And so, but I think a doubling down on relationships is really what matters um, because if you're there for the long game and not just the short game, it's, it's, it's going to work out and it'll work out well. But I think that the time at Penn state, you know, I think back to people like Rod Kirsch and Dave Lee and others who are leading advancement at the time there. um, And also Susan Welsh, the Dean of the college who I worked with, you know, the um, element of humility, the humility of grace, um, calm under pressure. um, You know, those were things that, you know, you just can't, you can't put a, a measurement on in your career of what you watched and what you learned. And, you know, we don't always hit it ourselves. We miss the mark sometimes, but I, I reflect back on those things sometimes a lot, because I think that, you know, when, when you're having to stand up in front of your team or coach or advise during these challenges, I mean, that's, that's where really you own your stripes. And so um, for me, those were really learning moments and I, and I reflect on them constantly, but how do, you, how do you have a playbook for risk mitigation? How do you have a playbook for downturns? How are you thinking ahead um, and, uh, and trying to th- see what's around the curve, not just as you're driving into the curve? And so, um, you know, again, 
I, they were tough times. I'm not going to say they weren't. Um, but at the same time, I think the relationships and the deep love for each other and in the institutions is, is really stronger than any, any crisis or issue that, that we may have to go through. Mark, when you talk about relationships, I think about it in, in sort of three different maybe phases and the lines probably get blurry. But when you think about that uh, individual you referenced having the Reuben in Philly, that individual has a relationship with Penn State. They have a relationship with Mark, the fundraiser. And then there's this question of Mark, the person. And you referred to that individual as your dear friend. And I'm curious when you think about your career, or even as you, you know, coach your current team, how do you balance the fact that on one hand, you're a, a fundraiser representative of the institution, that individual had a relationship with the institution years before you got there. And hopefully for years, uh, you know, if, if you leave beyond, um, but then you talk about that sort of really deep personal relationship, friendship, um, is that a blurry line or, or, you know, I don't know, I guess I've had some fundraisers say, Hey, look, like I'm not their friend. I'm the representative on behalf of the institution. And uh, I, I just like your thoughts on that. I, I guess some could view it as a blurry line or a gray area, uh, Brent. Um, I never have. Um, I mean, you know, what I tell our team and what I've always said to myself, people know what we do for a living. I mean, people, when, when people take a call, when people have a visit, I mean, they know our jobs are to grow philanthropy or uh, expand relationships with the institution, whether you're in the alumni relations side or the development side of the house. I mean, they know that, but they also want honesty and transparency. I mean, this is the, going back to your question before, unlike sales, where it's, um, you know, I'm in sales and I'm going to give you tickets to a football game and we're going to sit together and I'm going to, you know, Steward in that way. I mean, most of the people that we interact with could get whatever they wanted themselves. I mean, and so really what they want is honesty. They want a little inside baseball. Um, they want transparency. They want a partnership. And, you know, I've kind of viewed this as, um, you know, sometimes you can get too close to an individual and you may not be the person to actually ask for a gift. You need to bring someone else in to do that. But this close relationship is just part of what we do. It should be how we're hardwired. And again, we have to remember we work for the institution um, at the at the end of the day. And so, you know, we 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 have to be company men and women uh, in that regard. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, shooting straight with people, being honest with people, being trustworthy, um, not being uh, transactional and how we deal with them. Um, is a very important part of the equation. And again, I'm going to hit it again because I really think it's an, an issue with our industry. And we can all jump jobs. You know, I have left uh, employers before, but you know, I've only been at three institutions since the day I was 21 years old. And part of that, and I hope to be at Virginia a very long time. And it's it's part of this is it's part of the relationship. And and um, I just think you know if you're trying to ask someone for hundred thousand dollars, that's one thing. But if you're trying to have transformational gifts. These things are long time relationships. And so uh, we have to be stewards of those. So I, I have not, viewed, going back to your question, I have not viewed it as a blurry or gray area, but I've been pretty clear about what is my role and what is my identity. And, you know, if we, if uh, there are certain times when I'm blurring it, I need to, I need to put it in check. Um, and our, our, our team has to put it in check, but it's just part of what we do. And I just think it's something you have to embrace. You just, shared that you've only had three jobs since you were 21. And I am curious if you would just walk me through the decision to leave Penn State and go to UVA. I mean, you're a small town Pennsylvania guy. You go to Allegheny College. You're then in State College. I mean, you're sort of just in this, uh, uh, you know, 100 mile uh, radius, if you will, for a good chunk of your life. Um, what inspired you to take the opportunity at UVA? And then also, was there any culture shock? Did it feel different um, once you were uh, in a professional context outside of Pennsylvania? Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny, Brent. Um, you know, I think when I went to work for Penn State, I, I kind of felt like it was a Rudy moment, you know, like, you know, Rudy going to Notre Dame. It was like Mark's working for Penn State. You know, it was it was a place that we went to football games when I was a kid and would travel the distance to go to it. So, you know, absolutely. There was a great tie. And, and we had a wonderful 15 years in state college. Um, great, great opportunity for us. 
you know, I think for Virginia, um, my interest in potentially going to Virginia actually started about a year out of college. Um, and I was invited to by a client at the time when I was working for Affinity. I was invited to Charlottesville for a Penn State UVA football game. And everyone expected Penn State to beat Virginia. Uh, but I came down, went to the game, tailgated, went to enjoy the weekend here in Charlottesville and UVA beat Penn State. And I came home and I remember saying to my wife, uh, she's like, I, I'm guessing you're pretty mad, you know, Penn State lost, et cetera. And I said, you know, I actually kind of fell in love with this town and I fell in love with the place. And I said, you know, if I ever leave State College, there's probably one place I would go and it's Charlottesville. And so, you know, I was uh, at the, we were heading towards the end of the campaign at Penn State. We had been very successful despite all the challenges. And uh, I got a call uh, right before the holidays from my predecessor, Bob Sweeney, um, asking me if I had interest in maybe coming to Virginia um, to, to really be his number two. And, you know, I have to say it caught me off guard. I hadn't updated my resume in years. I wasn't looking to leave, but it was Virginia and it was a good opportunity. And Bob, I, you know, I would say this to anyone who's listening to this, you know, I give Bob great credit. That initial conversation he had with me, he told me how much he was going to pay me. He told me the good and the bad of the potential job. He told me the things that he'd be thinking about, how he was willing to mentor me. It was the most transparent first conversation I've ever had with anybody as regards to moving to, a, uh, to another institution. And, it, you know, and I remember saying to him, Bob, I, you know, I have to update my resume and and, uh, you know, I'll get back to you after the holidays. And he said, no, I, I And to Bob's credit. He said, I want to know by Christmas if you're willing to think about Virginia. And so literally on Christmas Eve, I snuck down to the basement in my Penn State hoodie and called Bob and said, OK, I'm interested in coming to Virginia. So, you know, it was it, my my kind of love affair for Virginia started at a, at a young age uh, right out of school. But, you know, coming here. It was just an, an absolutely tremendous experience. Um, you know, I worked under Bob for a few years before he retired, uh, worked with President Sullivan, and Bob really invested a tremendous amount of time in developing a succession plan. Obviously, it was up to me and up to the university if that would happen when Bob retired. But, you know, I think about the opportunity to work for Bob for two years and how you work with the board, how you work with donors, how you work with internal politics. I mean, I hadn't worked at that level before. And so Bob invested a tremendous amount of time in me to kind of get me prepared um, for if the opportunity availed itself once he retired for that job. And so, um, you know, I, I just can't say enough. I, I absolutely love Virginia, as I said before, hope to be here a very long time. Um, but it was the investment going back to relationships. It was the investment of Bob willing to take a bet on me as a young guy and to think about what this, what the future could hold for Virginia and for me. Um, you know, I still talk to Bob all the time. Uh, even though he's been retired for you know five or six years, whatever it is now. Um, but it, it was really a, an investment in a, in a mentor investing in me. Might need to get Bob on the podcast sometime here, yeah, Mark. Um, all right. Well, tell me a little bit about your role today. What is your job? When you think about the scale at which you all are operating, you're in the middle of a $5 billion campaign. You have a uh, tradition of a, a, a quite decentralized um, organization with obviously some very strong central services. There's a lot under your purview. And uh, I know a huge part of your, your job is building a strong leadership team, which you've done so that you don't need to be um, in the weeds on every decision. But when you think about the role of a, of a vice president today uh, in the context you're operating right now, um, how do you summarize it? Yeah, you know, it's hard to summarize, but I, I would just say, you know, as uh, wonderful as Virginia had been for many, many years in the, in the advancement space, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of opportunity for growth as well. Um, and I, you know, kind of took that on as the challenge, you know, how do we, how do we grow from, I think the time I got here, we were, you know, raising about 250 to $270 million a year, you know, we're now averaging, you know, over 500 million a year, but, you know, there were a lot of work to update our our infrastructure. There was a lot of uh, work to build collaboration and coordination. We had a presidential transition in the, in the last few years. Uh, a lot of new team members coming in. So, you know, I, I've, I hate to put it on relationships, but I'm going to come back to that once again, Brent, because, uh, you know, one of the things I learned from Rod Kirsch at Penn State was, you know, you need to invest as much time in relationships internally as you do externally. And so, 
I've spent a lot of time, you know, again, we've built a great senior team. We have a great team across the grounds, but really specialists in these different areas. So someone who's really strong in operations, someone who's really strong in alumni engagement. Some of those were internal promotions uh, and some of those were new hires that we had to make. So you're really trying to diversify the team to really see the areas for growth. I, I think the other thing I would just say is under the purview of the position is really taking the long game. Um, and how do we how do we tackle this this year? How do we tackle that next year? And how everyone understands what our plan is and communicate that plan. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities, and I think you know in, in my role, um, I'm just I'm lifted up by great people every day and who know my strengths and know my weaknesses. Um, and how do we build out that organization to do that um, across the grounds here in Virginia? So you know I think the one thing I've really enjoyed uh, probably more than anything is. Uh, I, I've always been pretty diligent about keeping a major gift or principal gift part of my job, uh, not just being in management, but actually being in the marketplace, so to speak. And, uh, and again, having a great team allows me to do that. So that's with the president or with others. And so, you know, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun, but, you know, I guess I would summarize it by just saying that that kind of entrepreneurial experience I had early in my career, affinity it, you know, the, the great thing I love about being at Virginia is it's a very entrepreneurial climate um, within a very big and complex institution. So it gives me the benefit of kind of being an entrepreneur uh, within the organization, while at the same time having great uh, respect for the traditions and culture and history of a place that's, you know, over 200 years old. So it's, uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Are there gifts that you've been a part of in the last, you know, five years or so that are particularly memorable doesn't mean they have to be the the largest gifts necessarily. But when you think about some of that uh, principal gift side hustle that you're keeping, uh, yeah. what what stands out? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer, Brent, that a major gift is in the eyes of the donor and shouldn't be in the eyes of the institution. So, you know, whether it's a ten thousand dollar gift because that's what someone can afford to do. Um, that's a pretty meaningful one. You know, at the same time, it could be a $100 million commitment that someone has an interest in. You know, I think for us, I would say more broadly, the biggest uh, interest I've had is really how do we expand our uh, financial aid capacity? Um, this was uh, not an institution that had raised a lot for financial aid, uh, you know, prior to my coming here. And and it was, a, it, it was you know, a very strong focus on financial aid, but not around philanthropy for financial aid. So, you know, try, how do you create those levers? And um, we've really tried to develop a culture of co-investment with our, with our alums and with our donors and friends of how do we both have skin in a game. And I think that's been one of our biggest areas of growth is creating a culture of co-investment. You know, what are our priorities? What are other people's priorities? So I, I'm not sure that I would actually pinpoint any one gift uh, Brent, but I would probably say the bigger thing to me is how do how have we created that culture of co-investment where we truly understand what the priorities of the institution are and what the priorities of the individual donor are and how do we work together to bring that to reality? And that's when it's really fun um, because then then you can really jumpstart a lot of things, whether it's a the Karsh Institute for Democracy that we launched or a new school of data science or, or raising money for financial aid or, or, you know, endowing professorships. We've had a tremendous amount of growth. You know, each one of those things to me is just the culture of co-investment is probably the biggest part of, of the whole equation. When you say co-investment, what do you mean? You know, I, I think there's a, I, I think one of the, this is my personal view and others may disagree with this point, but I think as philanthropy evolves, many of our uh, generous donors want to see where the university prior to, prioritization really is. And it's one thing to say this is a priority, but you know, presidents change, deans change, priorities change. But how do we how do we show that uh, level of co-investment? It may be as simple as you know, how do we partner on uh, looking at a building? Do we have donor insight, not donor insight? You know, everyone has different views on that type of thing, but that's working together. It could be on creating, leveraging your balance sheet and, and looking at how, you know, if we have available resources that we're going to put into financial aid, how do we take that money and say, okay, we want to leverage that and be a partner with you and, and create a matching fund program uh, internally that shows our investment along with you. And so I think every, every one's a little different. It may be different on a 50 or $100 million gift than it is for a $100,000 gift, but you have to be very disciplined when you get into that. You can't 
co-invest in everything or nothing's a priority, but really understanding what the priorities are and really knowing your donor base to know what their priorities are. So you can, you can find that, that area of, of synergy between the two of them. Um, but again, that's, it's not something you can do at every institution. They may not have the balance sheet to do it. So you may have to go up at the donors and think about ways to figure this out. But I think this idea of co-investment is, is really the future because, um, you know, there's a lot of areas where people can invest around the country from small, small nonprofits to faith-based organizations to higher education. And I think really being clear on your priorities and being willing to be a partner is really where we need to go going forward. Mark, your team reacted very quickly to the pandemic and you've got massive scale with the scope of the alumni programs and the different schools and units. We've talked uh, with uh, Julie Featherstone and Cindy Frederick and we saw just a rapid shift to a fully digital context. And I know now we're operating in more of a hybrid context. I'm just curious as you think about, um, let's say advancement three years from now, where everybody who wants to be vaccinated has been vaccinated. Hopefully this is largely behind us. What will come back and look the way it did in 2019 and what might never look that way again? That's a great question. You know, well, first of all, I may be a little biased, but um, I I know I'm a lot biased, but I mean, I do think we have one of the best senior teams in all of higher education advancement. And I think part of that is their scrappiness, their grittiness, their entrepreneurial spirit to pivot. I know it's an overused word these days, but, you know, I think they really did pivot from technology and infrastructure and supporting our team to even volunteering to be, you know, using their skills and concierge services to support parents and students when they're in quarantine areas. I mean, outside, way outside of what our world is. I think the team really just kind of stepped up to a whole new level in the the last 18 months. I think as we go forward, I think a couple of things. I think on the development side, um, I think that it's, uh, you know, what worried me the most, and everyone has different opinions on this, are are, are more junior professionals. I think we're, we're fine because they didn't know any better than to start relationships electronically. I think those with long-time relationships at the university, it really didn't matter what medium they used to communicate, whether phone or Zoom or um or in person. I mean, I had never been on Zoom myself prior to the pandemic, never once. I had never logged in. So I had always joined by phone calls. So it was new for all of us. Um, but the people in the middle, kind of mid-career professionals were the ones who worried me the most uh, because they had been trained one way, but they maybe didn't have deep enough relationships. And I think, how do we uh, educate and coach and mentor people on how to build those relationships, how to stay, how to use different vehicles, um, how to be more strategic? Um, you know, it's not just, hey, I'm in, I'm in Charlotte, let's have coffee at Starbucks, you know, maybe we could do that over Zoom and do some things and then be a little more sophisticated and and respectful of their time when we need to have a more in-depth conversation. I think from an alumni engagement standpoint, I think the virtual component is here to stay. And I think we have to be prepared for that. Um, uh, I love in-person events. That's, you know, again, I'm a relationship person and that's where, where it is. But, you know, if we can get a faculty member on a, on a Zoom presentation to talk to 2,000 people, inter, including international markets, and engage them the same way we would have an old traditional event in Richmond, um, that's a win. I mean, that's a big win. I mean, we're seeing people show up for planned giving seminars and having, instead of 30 people traveling to Charlottesville, we're having 1,000 people show up for a gift planning seminar. Uh, wow. I would never have guessed that a, a year and a half ago. And so, you know, I think for us, it's, and I think for the industry, it's really trying to figure out how we work in this component. How do we trust our employees to work in places where they can do their best work, whether it's in an RV traveling around the country or sitting in Charlottesville? Um, I think that we have to have closer trusting relationships. And I, the final thing I would say is um, continuing to invest and think about technology needs, Brent. Uh, and I'm not serving this up to you because of what you do, but I mean, I think that uh, this is a very evolving component of our business. And, you know, I think the old days of buying the big database and just being done for 20 years are kind of done. I mean, we have to think about how do we use our iPhones? How do we buy apps to simplify our lives? We need to be thinking about those same types of things in all aspects of our business um, to make it possible for people to work maybe in a hybrid remote work environment or for our alums to engage with us in a different way. Do they need to wait a year and a half for a glossy report 
or can they see this information within a month after the end of the fiscal year and do it on their own time? And so there's always going to be a balance between the, the demographics of the market and, and what we need to do to strengthen relationships. But I think we have to be constant in our ability to have these tough conversations and to say, you know, what we did last year may have been great for last year, but it may not be great for the next three years and not just take a 20 year horizon, but look at how do we evolve? And I think the the stronger organizations in the country will do that. And I think others will, will be challenged, but I think we have to, we have to maximize those opportunities. Yeah. I mean, look, one of the recurring themes that we hear is how can this shift, not just, uh, you know, it's not necessarily about the technology, it's about the adoption, right? Zoom was yeah. around for a decade before the yeah. pandemic. It just took that to, uh, to sort of explode overnight. And when I think about even in my own work, um, the leverage that you get from being a Zoom link away from everyone in the world is pretty amazing. And I'm just curious, when you think about the way that you work with President Ryan or with deans or with other key leaders who in the past could only be in one place physically every day. And I'm sure that over your career, you've dealt with the, how do we get the schedule to align so we can go to Chicago and have everybody there at the same time. And it's a bear. Now you can sort of say, do you have 20 minutes here, there, uh, you know, can, can everybody connect via zoom? And I'm just curious if you had any experiences where you, you, you personally, you and president Ryan, you and others, uh, on the leadership, we're able to connect with donors in, in that environment where it was actually a better experience for the donor, way lower cost for UVA, far more efficient for everybody. Um, any, any examples that stand out? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Brent, I think about stewardship um, is the way I would say it. So one of the things yeah. that our, our board of visitors, our governing board for the university uh, started to do several years ago was during the advancement committee meetings was starting to invite donors to the board meeting, uh, not to sit in on governance, but to recognize a big gift or to show appreciation, whatever. And, you know, that was, that was tough because you're trying to think about busy schedules. How do we get someone to fly from LA to Charlottesville for an hour meeting um, where we announce a, a very generous commitment? But, you know, now we're in a space where, you know, we can have a, a board meeting once a quarter and invite the donor to participate and announce their gift. And they're still sitting in their homes um, and not having to travel. And we're able to have that, you know, uh, we can pull in other people from all different things, whether it's a faculty member who's on, who's on sabbatical somewhere, who is going to be impacted by the gift or a student who's is studying abroad, you know, wherever yeah. that may be. Like we can do stuff like that, that we never did before. Um, you know, we're talking with a donor here now on a, on a commitment that we're announcing here soon. And, and the donor just can't be here physically for a variety of reasons. And so, but she can watch and we can invite other people to the meeting. And it's just been a home run. It's been a home run for engaging people. It's been a home run for the board to get closer with donors. Um, it's just, it's been great. So again, I would not have thought ever a year and a half ago of inviting someone to be on a video during a board meeting to thank them for their philanthropy, but it's just been great. And so I, I just think those are the things we have to think about. I'm getting, if we have them in person, that would be even better, but sometimes it's, it's, it's just the best thing for them and for us to, to utilize technology in that capacity. I wonder if there's a kid in Allegheny Clarion area right now selling hoagies over zoom. I wonder if that shift happened too, because that's probably more efficient than mapping it out uh, all over town. Well, I would tell you if they were, I'd buy them. Uh, I'd, I'd be <laughs> for sure. I love it. Uh, our time is, is wrapping here, but I do just want to get your perspective on uh, where you are as an organization. We've got a lot of folks listening from all over the country. Is UVA hiring? Um, what are some of the things you're excited about? Um, as you uh, think about 2022 and beyond? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think things are things are really going well at Virginia. I mean, I don't mean that to be arrogant, but I just say, you know, the, as, as you mentioned earlier, we have a $5 billion campaign. We're at $3.7 billion right now, or about, you know, 74% of goal. Uh, we have four years left in the campaign. Um, so we're, we're, again, tracking way ahead of schedule. Obviously, we're we don't want to be arrogant by that because things can happen as we talked about before. And so we got to, we got to keep working hard. Um, but we are hiring, obviously, like most institutions, we had a hiring freeze last year and held back a little bit, but we have a, a number of positions open at the schools and units. Uh, 
and also at the center. And so, you know, for us, something we've really involved uh, a lot of time over the last few years is you talk about centralization or decentralization. We've really tried to be pride ourselves in being a hybrid organization. So, you know, there may be someone who, who is really interested at this time in their life to be at a school or unit. Like, that's great. Like that, that and whether, like, we want to help you do that. If it's, or if you have an interest of now, you know, talking about Carol Packard early in our conversation, going from a unit into the center enterprise, like, that's great too. I think we all have evolutions in our career. And I think for us, um, you know, we are, um, I think one of the things I'm excited about is we are really experimenting in a hybrid workforce. Um, and, you know, if, if you're a fundraiser and you're on the road three days of the week and you want to come home and help out with the kids and, you know, have some laundry and do whatever you need to do and work from home for like, that's fine. Like you need to do your job and you need to excel and you need to surpass expectations and everything like that. But we really are trying to invest more in how do we trust our employees? How do we trust our team? How do we invest in them in that capacity? So, you know, for me, I, I couldn't be more bullish on Virginia as we go forward. And again, I think we have just a, an amazing team, but I think it's, uh, you know, whether I think there's just a lot of things that have been fun at Virginia, as I mentioned before, whether it be this culture of co-investment, you know, we're well-funded for the campaign. Um, you know, we, we just have a lot of benefits that, you know, maybe some other places may or may not have. Um, and it's just a fun time to be in this business. But at the same time, you know, I think that the other thing I would just say quickly, Brent, is we really want to, we really want to support the overall industry. So, you know, if someone calls us and has an interest in a position, you know, we're happy to talk about the, the strengths of other institutions. Like our whole industry has to grow. And it's probably the thing I love most going from your conversation about the corporate world to higher education. Um, you know, we have different markets. We have different, but we have the ultimate goal of helping improve uh, education across America. So for, for us, it's we want UCLA to grow as soon as we want Michigan to grow or Harvard or Yale. And so, you know, this is a, uh, it's a very collaborative space to be in if you're not in higher education and, you know, the benefits of picking up the phone and calling Harvard and saying, you know, we know someone who's really good who's just not a good fit for Virginia, but we think that'd be great for Harvard. Um, that's a cool space to be in versus the kind of constant red ocean strategy of fighting over market share and things like that. That's just not the culture we have. And so I think that whatever we can do to help the industry and help those who have an interest in the industry, that's great. I love that, Mark. Uh, great thoughts to conclude on. I, I, you know, we are privileged to be working in such a collaborative um, sector. And while we are uh, on the for-profit side, we feel strongly that uh, we've got to do everything we can to align our mission with your mission and uh, and to push the sector forward at a time when there are plenty of challenges and tough headlines from time to time. But uh, we still believe uh, deeply that um, everything from financial aid to facilities can play a huge role in uh, changing the tra trajectory of people's lives. So thank you for all the work that you do for taking time out of your schedule uh, to share with our audience. You've got an amazing reputation. And I think that uh, everybody listening uh, just got a sense uh, as to why that is. So uh, with all of that said, uh, I'd encourage you to look up Mark, uh, reach out to him on LinkedIn, mention that you uh, heard him on the podcast um, and, um, and, and we'll all uh, keep moving forward together. So with that, Brent, signing off with today's guest, Mark Llewellyn, Vice President for Advancement at the University of Virginia. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.